World War II has always been famous for many things, but especially its air campaigns. Sure, the First World War had planes and the occasional Zeppelin bombing, but World War II took it to the next level. It established that air superiority wins wars. Or at least conventional wars. Cold War era guerrilla fighting challenged that. Either way though, whether the Blitz in London, the Allied air campaign across Europe, the fire bombings of Japan, or of course the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the use of warplanes are vital to the course of that war. For the United States during the war, the usual understanding is that Japan bombs the United States in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor, there's a bit of fighting on the islands at the western edge of Alaska, and otherwise the rest of the country was untouched for the entire war. Japan just didn't have the capabilities to try and blitz the United States in the same way that Germany did to Britain or the Allies did to Germany. However, there was in fact quite a large bombing campaign conducted by Japan against not just the United States, but even the other allied powers of Canada and Mexico. They managed to bomb roughly 300 targets, getting as far as the US states of Nebraska and Michigan in the middle of the country. Now, I wouldn't blame you for raising an eyebrow at that claim. I mean, surely you would have heard of such an event of the war like that, right? How could they have pulled that off or even fly planes that far? Well, don't worry, the reason why you've never heard of it is that while everything I said was technically true, it's also true that this campaign was a failure that only managed to kill six people. It also wasn't done by any Japanese plane, but rather balloon bombs. Some of you who have been subscribed to this channel for a while may remember that back in 2017 I made a short video on this topic, but it was only three minutes long and very basic. This video is going to go more in depth on the topic because it's interesting and it deserves to be talked about for longer than three minutes. We're going to learn about Fu-Go, Japan's balloon bomb campaign across North America. While I will be citing multiple sources for this video, the one I am drawing from the most is Robert C. Mikesh's Japan's World War II Balloon Bomb Attacks on North America. Aside from his authoritative expertise on the topic, it had an excellent amount of images and maps that really helped to detail this video. Now, the first obvious question is, how did Japan manage to bomb 300 targets across North America? The distance was too far, and Japan couldn't even get past Midway, so any targets past Alaska and Hawaii were surely unreachable, especially by the final years of the war. Well, as previously mentioned, Japan used balloon bombs. While the idea of using balloons as weapons was not, by World War II, a new idea, the logistical limitations of Japan's air capabilities as the war progressed is what made Japan consider them in the first place. This campaign was an act of desperation, and by the time the United States was conducting more bombing raids of their own on Japan itself, they just didn't have any other options. But before getting into the details of Japan's aerial American assault, I'm going to talk about this video's sponsor, Private Internet Access. I value my privacy, and believe personal data is, well, personal. I don't want random strangers and companies to pry on that and sell it, and I can't imagine you do either. Just like how the nations of World War II knew it was important to use ciphers to keep their military plans a secret from the enemy, you should protect your data with your own tool. And for me, that tool is Private Internet Access VPN. Private Internet Access, or PIA, is a VPN provider available for all platforms that hide your IP address and encrypts your internet connection. PIA is considered the world's most transparent VPN provider, as despite having over 30 million downloads of its VPN, they never record or store user data. You can even use it for an unlimited number of devices at the same time, and it's even one of the few VPNs that support peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Have you ever wanted to watch something on a streaming service but found it's only available in a different country? Like for example, I enjoy Archer, but for some reason it's only on Netflix and everywhere else but the United States. All I have to do is change my geolocation with the VPN, and now I can watch it on Netflix just fine. By clicking my link in the description, you can get 83% off on private internet access, which means you'd only be paying $2.03 a month, and that's in addition to also getting 4 extra months for free. If in spite of all that you still somehow don't enjoy PIA, there's 24-7 customer support and a 30-day money-back guarantee. So click the link below, sign up for private internet access VPN, and thanks to private internet access for sponsoring this video. In terms of design, the general idea was the balloon would drift towards America, being carried by the wind currents of the Pacific. The heat and gases of the air during the day would keep it afloat, and then whenever it would cool in the evening, there would be contractions causing it to sink. Inside the balloon, there were devices triggered by the contractions that would result in the balloon dropping an object attached to it. 
The first three would be sandbags or similar objects so the balloon could get back and up in altitude in case it needed to go further, because usually it took three days to cross the Pacific. But the final trigger from contractions would drop the bomb, and hopefully that bomb goes off. Such a system obviously has some flaws. What if it takes a balloon too long to reach America and it goes off before reaching there? What if it somehow just doesn't descend? What if the trigger messes up? That was just a risk that they had to make, and they needed to do something. Even in terms of targets, there wasn't much of a way to determine a specific target. There were multiple launch sites with the hope of heading towards a general area, but when you're relying on random winds, you can't exactly expect much. From Japan's point of view, they thought their best hope of maximum damage would be that the bombs would land in the forests of the western United States and cause forest fires that would hopefully be devastating enough to distract U.S. resources. Now, considering the U.S.'s scary war production abilities after Pearl Harbor, I personally doubt that would have slowed the United States down enough to even matter, and it certainly wouldn't have changed the course of the war. Despite the simple design of a hot air balloon with a bomb attached to it, when it came to working on the bomb balloons, somehow the rivalry between the Japanese Army and Navy managed to get involved with it. The design proposed by the Japanese Navy had the balloon made of a rubberized silk material, while the design proposed by the Japanese Army had the balloon made of paper. Rubberized silk was a sturdier material which would make their journey across the Pacific Ocean easier in avoiding accidental damage along the way. However, paper balloons were lighter in weight, meaning they could carry a bigger payload of explosives. In the end, Japan decided to make both, although they made many more paper balloons. Starting in October of 1943, they began to mass-produce these balloons, utilizing the help of not just the Army and Navy, but a few businesses and even some high school student volunteers. Their goal was to make 10,000 balloons, and by the end of the war, they had made and launched roughly 9,300 balloons. Various numbers of balloons were released from multiple launch sites across Japan at different dates, but overall we know of 285 balloons that made their way across the ocean and either got intercepted, discovered, or exploded during the war. The first balloon to reach the vicinity of America that we know of was actually intercepted 66 miles off the coast of California on November 4th, 1944 by the U.S. Navy, and it didn't go off. Across a 10-month period, 200 balloons made their way to the United States, with some as far east as the state of Michigan. In addition, 78 arrived in Canada as far east as Manitoba, and two managed to make it to northwestern Mexico. The remaining five, meanwhile, were intercepted at sea. How many of these actually exploded? Technically, we don't fully know. While some definitely were seen exploding, many more were simply found on the ground, likely days after landing, and several were found as ripped parts or in fragments, which means it could have gone off, but it doesn't necessarily mean it went off. The balloon could have just torn upon entry and crashed without setting the bomb off. This entire campaign, if we still seriously want to call it that in the end, only resulted in one balloon causing any casualties. On May 5th, 1945, one of the balloon bombs made its way to outside the town of Bly in the state of Oregon, and exploded resulting in the deaths of six people. Archie and Elsie Mitchell were taking their Sunday school class of five children on a picnic when the landed balloon was noticed. Archie tried to warn them not to mess with the balloon, but unfortunately the balloon exploded, leaving Archie the only survivor. Today, you can find a monument remembering this tragedy, and this incident was not only the only case of deaths from the Fugo campaign, but also it managed to be the only deaths of World War II on mainland North America caused by enemy forces, the Aleutian Islands campaign being technically off the mainland. Most balloons landed in the wilderness, and as far as we know, no forest fires were started. While there was hope the winter would leave the forests dry enough for ignition, most of them were ironically damp from the weather of the time. The final recovered balloons were two balloons recovered unexploded on July 20th, 1945, one in Mount Pitt, Oregon, and the other in Indian Springs, Nevada. Throughout this time, Japan was eagerly trying to spy on American radio broadcasts to learn of their impact of the campaign. But thanks to most bombs landing in either uninhabited or sparsely habited locations, it was actually fairly easy for the American military to keep it a secret from the public up until May of 45, after the deaths of Bly in which case they finally gave warnings to the public. But during that period of silence, no radios broadcast anything, except for one allowed broadcast that briefly mentioned they found a Japanese balloon in Wyoming, but it failed to do anything. I'm sure the army loved trolling Japan that way. The Fugo campaign was overall a failure for the Japanese, but the threat of Japanese balloon explosives still remained even after the war was over, 
After all, thousands were launched, so there was easily a chance for more than just 285 balloons making it to the continent. That's just the number of balloons that were found during the war. As it so happens, 14 more balloons were discovered in the United States up through the 1970s. And then all the way in 2014, another one was found in Canada that still had a live bomb and needed to be disabled. Those extra 15 bring the total to around an even 300. But who knows, maybe some are still out there. And the fact that one of them was still alive in 2014 means that technically, someone could be in danger if they find one. So basically to sum it up, it is technically true that Japan managed to conduct a massive air campaign that targeted hundreds of locations, from Canada to the United States to all the way down in Mexico, that struck fear in American hearts. It just so happens it was done with balloons and basically was a failure. I'm Emperor Tigerstar and I'll see you guys next time.